The name Theodore Malgorn is a name that uh, I'm guessing you don't recognize. Anybody recognize the name Theodore Malgorn? No. Uh, but I'm also guessing that you have seen a photograph uh, that has Theodore Malgorn in it. In 1989, there was a photograph taken that became one of the most reproduced images ever. I want to show you that photograph. Raise your hand. Have you seen that photograph before? Probably a, a lot of you. So the, the back story, uh, the lighthouse is called La Jument, and uh, the lighthouse gatekeeper was Theodore Malgorn. And in 1989, they were transitioning that lighthouse to become fully automated. So no more lightkeeper needed. And uh, there was a photographer named Jean Guichard. And he wanted to take pictures of the lighthouse uh, to capture the story about it becoming fully automated. And so he went up in a helicopter, flew out over the English Channel to this lighthouse. And uh, serendipitously, just as Jean Guichard was pushing the button on the shutter to take the, the picture, Theodore Melgorn heard the sound of the helicopter and walked out onto the terrace of the lighthouse to uh, inspect the, the sound where it was coming from. And just at that same moment, this furious wave from the Atlantic Ocean was crashing against the other side of the lighthouse. All of that came together to create this incredible picture, this precise moment of Malgorn standing safely in this little pocket created by the lighthouse, this little safe haven, this little refuge, while this enormous wave was crashing against the lighthouse. It's no wonder that this image captured the imagination of the world. I wonder if this is what the psalmist had in mind when in Psalm 46 he wrote these words, God is our refuge and strength. God is our, our refuge. He, he creates this little safe haven for us, this, this pocket for us. He's mindful of us. He knows our, gent our fragile nature. He knows our condition. He knows that we are more dependent on him than a, a baby is on his nursing mother. He's aware that we are dust, that we are mortal. And so he is our refuge. He creates this, this pocket for us, this refuge, this safe place. But God is also our strength, which means he, he faces the storm steadfast resolute. The psalmist would go on to say that the Lord raises his voice and the earth melts. He breaks the spear. He shatters the, the sword. He makes wars cease. God is our refuge and God is our strength. And it's actually because of his strength that he's able to be our refuge that he's able to be gentle with us, that he's able to create this, this pocket, hide us in the cleft of the rock. This morning, we're going to continue our sermon series, And, and we're lifting up these two words, gentle and strong. Gentle and strong, these are words that describe God, the way he relates to us, and they're words that uh, we are called to embody as we relate to one another. <clears throat> Join me as we pray. Father God, would you grant us insight that we might perceive you as you truly are, and also that we might perceive ourselves as we truly are and as we are called to be. And I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this past week, in my own devotional time, I've been camping out in the, the letter of Ephesians, just reading it every day in full. And uh, Ephesians is an amazing letter. 
If you have a, a case of the, the spiritual blahs, uh, Ephesians is the remedy. Uh, camp out in Ephesians, and you're going to see some amazing things. So the, the letter is six chapters long, but there is a very clear division right in the middle. The first three chapters are, are this incredible truth. There's not one single command in the first three chapters of Ephesians. It's like pulling up to a, a buffet full of the most richest truths in Scripture. So in those first three ch chapters, we, we learn things like, like we are loved more than we can possibly know. That God has lavished, that's the word that I love from Ephesians, he's lavished his love on us. He chose us before the creation of the world. Before we did one single thing deserving of his love, he chose us. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons and as his daughters. And, and we were dead in our sins, Ephesians 2 says, and he made us alive in Christ. And then Ephesians 3, chap, uh, chapter 3, ends with this incredible prayer where Paul is praying for the church. He's praying for us, and the thing he prays is that we might comprehend the love of Christ, a love that is beyond height and width and depth and, and length, a love that he says is actually beyond knowing. Like you can't know this unless God does a work, it's spiritually understood that we might know the depth of God's love. So the first three chapters, we are loved. Know who you are. Know God's love. And then there's a, a very clear division. Chapter four is and through six is all of the therefore. Now, because of this, because you are so loved, therefore, chapter four, five, and six, this is how you are called to live. And so we're going to just look at the, the first verse and the first half of verse two, and then we're going to skip to a, a verse in verse six. What do you suppose is the, the first application? We're so loved Sons, daughters, made alive in Christ, adopted, chosen, predestined. What do you think would be the first application? It's kind of surprising. So we're going to look at chapter 4, verse 1. And it says this. Paul is writing from prison. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then. The then is like, therefore. Therefore, in light of everything I just said. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Okay? I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We're loved more than we deserve, adopted as sons and daughters. We did not choose him. He chose us. He chose us while we were dead in sins, and he made us alive in Christ. And then Paul says, live a life worthy of all of this that you have received. We really need to pay close attention to the, the order of that. I was asked uh, before church um, uh, to have a conversation with someone about how, how do we talk with uh, Muslims about our faith and about the differences of Christianity. And, and, and this is one of the things that we might say. Because... Uh, as far as I understand, most of the world religions, it's all about how do we earn God's favor? What are all the things that we need to do, all of the religious hoops that we have to jump through to earn God's favor? Christianity flips that on its head. It says, no, you are given this gift, and the things that we do are not to get it. The things that we do are because we've been given it. We operate out of this, this blessing, out of this giftedness, and therefore we do these things to, to honor God, to, to express our appreciation for all that he's done. He's worthy of our worship, but it's not to, to become a child that we do these things. It's like you're our children. We don't have children and then ask them to perform to become our children. No, they are our children. They are children by virtue of birth. And then, you know, we, I heard this, maybe you did. Uh, you are one of our family. You represent us, blah, 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 blah. 
You know, we, we live a life because of who we have been, uh, who, the gifts that we have received. Verse 2, this is fascinating to me. Remember, this is like the first admonition. Here it is. Be completely humble and gentle. Like all of these things, you are so loved. Sons, daughters, now here's what I want you to do. Be completely humble and gentle. Like, my gosh, God, you've got us positioned. We're ready to, to do anything. Jump and we'll say how high. Send me to the front lines and, and I'll go. Call me to attack the enemy and I'll attack. Call me to lead and I'll lead. I pledge to you my life. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. And this is what God says. Okay, be completely humble and gentle. That word completely is an interesting word because the sentence would make, make sense if we just eliminated it. Okay, this is what I want you to do. Be humble and gentle. Why do you think Paul included the, the qualifier completely? It's because he anticipated what we would do. All right, well, let's, let's put some conditions on our humility. Like, what about this situation? What about this circumstance? Can I be, like, occasionally humble? Humble when it, it's convenient? Humble when I'm with someone else who is also being humble? Paul anticipated this, and so he inserts the word, no, completely humble. But what about, no, but what about? Completely humble. As a dearly loved child of God, the call is not to partial humility. It's not to occasional humility. It's not to convenient humility. The call, the fitting response to the love of God is nothing less than complete humility. That Greek word for humility in the Greek culture in the first century was a derogatory word. Humility was not a virtue. To, to call someone humble, to describe their actions as, as, as being uh, humble, would be to say something negative about them. So humility in their mind, it was reserved for the lowliest of the low, the, the servant to the servants, the lowest station in life, it was not a compliment. To be considered humble was, was downright humiliating. The idea of striving to be humble, like I'm going to pursue humility, unthinkable. Who in their right mind would strive to, to be humble, to lower themselves? In our language today, we have a similar idea, but, but we use different words. We say like, that person's a doormat. You know, and that's obviously, that's not a compliment, calling someone a, a doormat. That, that person allows themselves to be walked on by others. That idea is repulsive to us. We want to say to them, have a little dignity. Stand up. Take a stand. Don't take this abuse. God's word takes a, a little bit different approach. We have dignity. Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, we have more dignity than, than we could possibly imagine, more love than we could possibly imagine. Because we are secure in our dignity, because we are secure in our love, because we're secure as children of God, we are uniquely positioned to show up in this world completely humble. I don't need to get you to, to affirm me. I, I am affirmed by God. I can show up and, and love you empty-handed. I, I can show up and, and serve you. Who in their right mind is going to pursue humility? Who in their right mind is going to pursue gentleness? Well, let's start with Jesus. Listen to how Jesus describes himself. And one of his most famous things that he said, come to me. All of you, come to me. You who are weary, you who are burdened, come and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am 
gentle and humble in heart. And notice the result. I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. You see, when we're in the presence of someone who is, is humble and someone who is gentle, it's transformative. It's good for our own souls to be in the presence of somebody like that. Jesus, notice what Jesus is doing. He's taking this derogatory word and he's applying it to himself. What you call despicable, awful, that's who I am. I came not to be served, I came to serve. This is like, this is revolutionary. He takes what the world says and he flips it on, the, on its head. The, the world elevates pride. You're like, make a name for yourself. Stand up and be counted. Calls that a virtue. Calls humility shameful, something derogatory. And Jesus flips it on its head and, and calls humility a virtue to be pursued. And pride is actually one of the, the most dangerous sins that exists. To be gentle, to be completely humble, what does that mean practically? Well, one of the things it means is that we are able to show up and take an active interest in other people. It means I'm, I'm genuinely interested in you, and, and I'm thoughtful, I'm mindful of you, I'm considerate of you, I'm mindful that on this box of you, of your life, there's a word that says fragile. Handle with care. Maya Angelou, the author, is credited of say, saying this. She said, at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said. They won't remember what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. Like, it is powerful to be in the presence of someone who is genuinely able to take an interest in you. And God calls us to be that person. It's attractive. It's winsome because it's a reflection of who Jesus Christ is is to be gentle to be humble is to recognize that there's a fragility that is common to the human experience we're all fragile again the world would consider this to be a derogatory statement to call somebody fragile would be to to insult them the world wants to hide vulnerability weakness fragility sticks and stones i don't know what they say today i'm sure there's some kind of expression that that gets that same thought across I, uh, by my wife, have been accused of being a bull in a china shop, and the accusation, I, I fear, has merit. I can be a bit klutzy and clumsy. Uh, when it comes to relationship, what God is saying is don't be a bull in a china shop. Be mindful of how you show up. Be mindful of the way you interact. Be mindful of the, the words that you say, what you do and how you do it. Be humble, be gentle. Now, don't believe for a second that any of this is weakness. Humility is not weakness. Gentleness is not weakness. The lighthouse on one side is gentle, carves out this safe space for this, this vulnerable person. But on the other side, the lighthouse is standing firm, resolute, looking the storm in its face and saying, you will not pass. Like, I am going to keep this person safe and I'm, I'm going to face the storm to do it. This is not weakness. This is strength that we're talking about. And so now we go from Ephesians 4 to the end to Ephesians chapter 6. And, and we've been talking about this at Vacation Bible School all week. Listen to this verse. We've just been told to be completely humble, be gentle. And now it goes to the end, and this is how it ends. Finally, be strong. Be humble, be gentle, and be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Be completely humble, be gentle, and be strong in the Lord.
There's nothing contradictory in those, those admonitions. The greatest demonstration of strength is humility, is gentleness. Weak people don't do that. Weak people refuse to be humble. Weak people don't treat others with gentleness. They're too preoccupied with their self to be mindful of what someone else might be experiencing. Be strong in the Lord. So, so how do we do that? How are we strong in the Lord? Those words, in the Lord, they're really important. Well, a good place to start is Ephesians 1 through 3. That's how we're strong in the Lord, is we're mindful of who we are in the Lord and what Christ has done for us and, and how we are positioned because of God's love for us freely given. So who are you today? You are, according to God's word, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a chosen child of God who has been made alive by Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, loved more than you will ever know. That's our strength. That's where our strength comes from. To be strong in the Lord means to live in that identity. I want to invite you to declare these things with me. Let's say them together. I am a chosen child of God made alive by Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, and loved more than I can know. That's who you are. Believe these things. Putting on the armor of God is an exercise in putting on these truths, recognizing this is who I am, because our enemy's greatest tactic is to take any one of those things and get us to not believe it, get us to to doubt it. This is what we're called to live out of. So this morning we come to the table. And as we do, we are coming to a Savior who is humble. I mean, think about it. God Almighty leaves heaven, comes to this earth, and comes in humility and lives his life in gentleness and humility. In Philippians chapter 2, there's a passage that is regarded as one of the very first hymns that the the early church sang. Now, we read it, and it doesn't sound much like a hymn, but there's evidence that this was something that they sang. And and we're going to read these words together. Would you put that slide up? Join me in reading this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That is humility. Jesus embraced humility all the way to the cross. What the world considers as derogatory, Jesus embraces and considers a virtue. And we just read that our attitudes should be the same. Should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So that's humility. And now as we continue reading, we get to strength. Join me. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is strength. The God who permitted himself to be nailed to the cross blew the hinges off death's door. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. In fact, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's strength. So today we come to meet our gentle, humble, strong Savior. And he promises to meet us in our fragile estate here at the table 
He promises to nourish us with his love and with his grace. And he pledges that this is just a small foretaste of the banquet that we're going to enjoy in heaven.